So with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce my good friend and arguably one of the most positive people in the world, Dr. Rick Knight from Colorado State University, who will be giving a presentation entitled, Can People and Wolves Coexist? The answer is somewhere in the Radical Center. Rick. Thanks, John. Oh, that's crazy academics. Um, yeah, so um, it, it is a pleasure uh, to be the last speaker on the panel. And um, I hope all of us had some time outdoors in this beautiful setting on the first day of fall. So in, um, in thinking about how I feel about wolves being reintroduced to Colorado, I am reminded of something Leopold wrote in the 1940s. He was writing about the disappearance of grizzly bears in the lower, for the lower for 48 United States. And he wrote, reserving grizzly bears to Alaska is like reserving happiness to heaven. I may not get there. So that's a little subtle, but, but hopefully you understand where I'm coming from. So um, it sounds like wolves are coming back. They're either coming back on their own or we're going to reintroduce them following the passage of this, this ballot initiative. There would be a variety of things, I think, that would um, speak to what all our speakers are speaking to if we could ensure these are part of this shared dialogue. Hold on. One of them would be if uh, Club 20, and, and maybe a number of you have never heard of Club 20, but it's, uh, it's an organization for the 20 West Slope counties. It would be very important, I think, if the county commissioners and Club 20 be intimately involved in the planning, the releases, and the monitoring. So they actually be, be involved as equal partners in this thing. And through a collaborative process, and this I actually believe will occur, a detailed situational assessment and feasibility analysis be completed that includes equal representation from the rural communities across Colorado's West Slope. Another thing is that a quiver of tools be made available to landowners to, minim to, to minimize these adverse wolf livestock uh, people interactions and I'm not sure how many of you are aware of the Western Landowners Alliance but this spring they came out with a wonderful report titled Reducing Conflict with Grizzly Bears, Wolves and Elk, a Western Landowners Guide. And so it's, it's uh, building on, I heard some incredible talks today from uh, Defenders of Wildlife, uh, Craig I think and uh, John gave wonderful talks about we really have to um, have these sort of tools so the landowners are not you know, stuck in a quandary, what do I do, uh, besides shoot, shovel, and shut up. So um, yeah, the Western Landowners Report's available online, and it's a good beginning. Lastly, a compensation program, and it's been very encouraging to hear all of us speak about the importance of a compensation program. And I'd like to say just a few more words about that. Um, the initiative actually requires the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission to fairly compensate um, owners for losses of livestock caused by gray wolves. Well, a fair, a fair comp comp compensation program will have to do more than pay the ranch family for the loss of so many pounds of animal on the hoof. What most of us, I think, fail to appreciate is that ranchers have worked on the genetics of their herds over decades. That is, their herds have been bred to fit a particular environment and its biotic and abiotic conditions. The animals, in a sense, are finely tuned to thrive in, a, in particular areas in those environmental conditions. So paying a rancher for the loss of pounds of meat is partial compensation. It's not actually fair compensation. That's going to have to include building some factor in, uh, we're going to need some sort of economic geneticist uh, to compensate them for the loss of genetics of that animal contributing to the herd. And another one uh, for this compensation program is that the, the source of funding can't just be for a couple of years. It's got to be a secure source of funding going into the future. I think that's very important. 
it's, it's taken me a lifetime. Um, so I'm ed educated as a wildlife biologist, all three degrees in wildlife biology from across the country. And it's really taken me a lifetime to finally realize that conservation that works is conservation that works for both people and for the land. Actions that are benefiting one of those two at the expense of the other are not conservation. They're, they're something else. And Wendell Berry, of all people, sunk the stake when he said, to save the land, you have to save the people. To save either, excuse me, Terry, <laughs> I know, sorry. You have to save both. So effective conservation, con conservation that actually works, is conservation that includes more than the ecological dimension. It has to include the economic dimension and the human dimension. For far too long, and you have to be a wildlife biologist to fully appreciate this, for far too long, we focused on the ecological dimension, disregarding the human and the economic dimensions. When you include local knowledge from human communities about the watersheds where they live and work, you may end up with a far better plan. And also, when you give fair consideration to people's livelihoods, the economic dimension, you are beginning to, cre to create a more equitable playing field. In other, in other words, when you leave out the human and economic dimensions, you've ensured yourself conflict and lasting resentment. Losers in these rural-urban wars do not forget, nor do their children. For too long, I've seen this cultural resentment passed on around kitchen tables in rural families. So initiative 107, as it's presently worded, specifies that the reintroduction plan use scientific data, quote unquote, pointedly leaving out the human and economic dimensions, thereby disregarding rural communities and their livelihoods. This is gonna create, again, another unfair balance of power. When these sources of inequality are built into a socio-political system, resulting differences are neither trivial nor short-lasting. These inequalities persist over time and space. And the West Slope has already had its share of inequities. Can consider how much of their water we take to support our booming front-range cities without so much as saying thank you. And now we're gonna give them wolves. These, un these, un these unequal power differentials remind me of the story of the pig and the chicken regarding a breakfast of bacon and eggs. The chicken is somewhat involved in breakfast because it donates eggs as it goes on living, but the pig is committed. That is, people from our metropolitan areas may very well appreciate hearing a wolf howl while they gather around a campfire on their West Slope vacation. Excuse me. But long after, yeah, long after they've returned to their front range homes, these rural families on the West Slope will still be trying to accommodate their new year round neighbor, wolves. So, regarding how we work with these people on, on the West Slope, where we will be reintroducing wolves, we need to show them empathy, not apathy and we need to show them respect. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, it's heartburn. <laughs> That's what it is, it's heartburn. <laughs> no, I've never had heartburn. Sorry. We, we, we need to show them respect, not neglect. This way of doing conservation takes longer, much longer. And this way of doing conservation is harder. It's much, much harder. But if you're willing to go slow and get it right, I can assure you the results are much longer lasting. And I know of what I speak on this. So the valley where I live, we were um, a number of years ago, the US Fish and Wildlife Service declared an inhabitant in our valley federally threatened. And it could have been a tsunami. It could have just absolutely ripped um, the private landowners and the agencies that, that occupy our valley apart. But it didn't. For seven years, we met. Oops, sorry. For 
seven years we met and talked and we walked the land and we worked patiently, <laughs> this is so embarrassing, <laughs> with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And we were eventually granted a habitat, we completed a habitat conservation plan and they gave us a takings permit. And today we have peace in the valley with our threatened neighbor. So it re reminds me of the saying, if you wish to go fast, go alone. If you wish to go far, go together. Sorry, I did not think this was gonna happen. Pardon, I'm, and this is so embarrassing. This is my dean down here. And, and, and technically I work for Terry as vice president of conservation for the Cattlemen Ag Land Trust. Well, it's a good thing that I'm aspiring for no higher position in either <laughs> organization. Yeah, so in our, in our, the other thing that's going on here, we, I think we need to remind ourselves, in this hectic world that we all live in, our dealings are almost transactional. In ranchers' lives, interestingly, in these rural communities, the interactions are relational. Let's take a page from their book and focus on relations rather than viewing this as just another 21st century transaction. So we should remind ourselves, we know how to reintroduce wolves ecologically. And we, this, this room, these talks today have given us ample evidence that we can definitely do it. In fact, the wolves maybe are also telling us they know how to bring themselves back, too. That apparently is somewhat um, divisive. But what we've yet to learn is how to bring them back ecologically with equal devotion to the human and the economic dimensions. This emphasis on the ecological dimension while ignoring the other two, I am worried, is going to give us two casualties wolves as well as rural communities. And I care far too much about both of those to support. To support the approach that just focus on the ecological dimension and leaves out the other two. Taking the time to get it right requires so much more than just patience. It requires empathy and respect for those with values different from our own. We need to learn to listen to those with different voices. We can do this better in Colorado. Let's show we can learn adaptively from what's taken place in other states and, um, and get on with it. Thank you very much. Thank you.